I'm joined by Eve and Theo from the Social Minds podcast. So what are we going to talk about today? Millennials. 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 We have to. If you believe everything you've read, if you fall into that bracket, you are lazy, you're very narcissistic, you're probably not doing very well for money, you'll never be able to afford a house. Eat too much avocado toast. Exactly. Being millennials, we feel that millennials are less defined by the situations around them, stuff like 9-11 and whatever. They're less defined by these situations and more defined by this boom of innovation that has happened between, say, 1982 to present day. You know, what defines a millennial is the people who have lived through a vast speed of technological change. All this media attention that millennials are getting and the reputation that they've got just refers to the, the snowflake generation, which people assume is like teens and 20-somethings yeah. when it's actually not. Mm, so yeah. when I think the majority of the time when people are saying, oh, millennial, millennial, they just mean young people yeah. Yeah. and they don't actually realise it stretches up to the age of 38. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm joined by Eve and Theo from the Social Minds podcast here in my beautiful new studio. Welcome. <laughs> hello, Hi, hello. Right? Good to have you back again. <laughs> Your studio. <laughs> um, well, I mean, today it's an adopted studio for yeah. me. This, of course. How are you? You good? Good. Yes. Yeah, really, really good. We've got you something, haven't we? Got you a saurine because I know how much of a fan you are. Look at that. I mean, it's actually <laughs> from Manchester as well, I believe. Yeah. Saurine, yeah. yeah. It's a Manchester, Is Manchester it really? cake. Cake. I suppose you could call it a squidgy loaf. It's a it is. So let Very, me tell uh, you. Loaf. Let me tell you about the difference between a cake and a biscuit. So cakes are not that applicable. Biscuits are, mm -hmm. and I think the reason for that is that cakes are not seen as a luxury item because you would inevitably have to buy birthday cakes presumably throughout the year. And Jaffa cake had to um, prove that they were a cake and not a biscuit to avoid the tax. Ah. And the way that you prove whether you're a biscuit or a cake is cakes when they're left out go hard and biscuits when they're left out go soft. Yeah, I don't know where you go on from there. Did That's you know sort of... that burgers from McDonald's have to have the pickles in? Otherwise, because of the amount of sugar, they would be classed as a cake. Are you kidding? No. I bet, yeah. Who yeah, told was, me that? I, I feel like it was Savory me. cake. I, I, I don't want to brag, you. but I think I was the one who said it, yeah. It was you. But I think I heard it off a guy who heard it off a guy who heard it off a guy who heard it from his brother. But I've taken yeah, it as gospel now. Fine, truth. Well, it's, on the <laughs> it. it's on the internet now, which means it's yeah. the truth. Around, yeah. So what are we going to talk about today? Millennials. 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 We have to. We have to talk about millennials in a way that we don't talk about millennials at the moment. Uh, we, need to, we need to see millennials differently, basically. And, well, I suppose we could take it from the beginning. Um, the theory around at the moment is that if you were born into 1982 or 1981, between then and 1996, let's say, you are classed as a millennial. So right now, the oldest, uh, 38, yeah. 37. Uh, the youngest, say, about 24, 23. It depends on which definition you look up as well, which is another massive issue because no one knows exactly where the timeline mm, starts mm. and where the timeline ends, which is causing a lot of confusion. So its Centre's Bureau starts at 1982 to 2000 and Pew Research is 1981 to 1997. So the youngest millennial could be 23 or 24. It shifts, And yeah. the oldest one could be like 37 or 38 and... No one really knows where the boundaries lie. And if you believe everything you've read, if you fall into that bracket, you are lazy, you're very narcissistic, you're probably not doing very well for money, you'll never be able to afford a house. <laughs> Eat too much avocado toast. Exactly. It's all these stereotypes that have come along that we, you know, whenever you see the word millennial, that you see. Um, and, it's, and it's as simple as that, really. And our argument with this is that, you know, in what other context would you group the sort of behaviours of a 38-year-old or 34-year-old or whatever with that of somebody 15 years younger than them because that's how mm. long the millennial generational span is. It's about yeah. 15 years. Well, I mean, I, I definitely count towards the top end. I'm 31 and I would count myself as a millennial. Um, but you are right. There seems to be a negative connotation. Mm. with mm. So what... What defines a millennial then, do you think, in terms of their behaviours, in terms of what they, how they act and stuff like that? Well, this is, this is something that we've thought a lot about and we've thought about in a way that if you tell the millennial story, it's you've got this, you've got this group of people that fall into this generation who have been affected by major 
events. So you've got things like people will always list the uh, financial crash. They'll list 9-11. They'll list, list stuff like that. Um, and also the way parents have been with their children, the uh, millennials are seen to be very... There's the term that goes around snowflakes that we always use. Yeah, and so me and they're meant to be, every day. Like, because that's a good point you brought up about like, so things like the financial crash of 9-11 and mm-hmm. the launch of the first iPhone all happened right in the middle of the millennial timeline. Mm-hmm. So they're meant to be um, a little bit more savvy um, with career routes. They don't follow traditional paths. They're more um, likely to go into entrepreneurship and things like that. They're less likely to get married. Um they're just a little bit more easygoing in some aspects than their than their parents were. Exactly. And like, yeah, like you said, a bit narcissistic and, and, if, and a little bit self-obsessed. And if we focus on that snowflake angle um, that is always sort of tarred with millennials, it, it's basically because uh, you, I'm sure you and a lot of your listeners would have seen the uh, video that Simon Sinek did. Um, mm-hmm. So he was a, he still is an author, sh- I should say, on YouTube. And he put out a video saying millennials in the workplace where for about 15 minutes, he basically tarred millennials with this brush and said they are like this because of this. And one of the main points on that was that millennials, our, our parents, they were very, uh, very safe with us. You know, they wrapped us up in sort of cotton wool and we were given uh, medals and trophies for coming last because it's about the participation <laughs> that counts. So, you know, if you look at millennials, the, the idea is that we're very sort of, uh, you know, a little bit self-effacing. We're very much wrapped in cotton wool. Um, we're very kind of, you know, butter wouldn't melt in some ways, but you don't want to, you know, every, we take everything very much to heart in a way. So that's where this whole snowflake idea comes from. Um, they're just stereotypes though exactly like yeah. you said like the, the main problem is because it spans like 15 to 18 years mm-hmm. there's no there's no way in hell all of those people are the same like they're all narcissists or like none of them want to get married or n- like none of them can mm-hmm. afford a house mm-hmm. like they are just sweeping generalizations but the problem is that like no other generation our industry has sort of taken those stereotypes as gospel and because they don't understand the generation because no one really knows uh, like what they want or how to speak to them they take the stereotypes as gospel and they're using them to target them mm-hmm. but they're just completely mm-hmm. wrong mm. so we've got a, well we've 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 got a completely different take on it in a way and that is um you know we're probably skipping forward a little bit but it's uh we we feel that millennials you know being millennials we feel that millennials are less defined by uh the situations around them stuff like 911 and whatever mm. they're less defined by these situations and more defined by this boom of innovation that has happened between say 1982 to present day really so uh if we can list it off we we you know the first Nokia phone i remember came in the mid 90s and then from there it was you know it, it took way before the mm. iPhone putting cameras into phones was a massive thing. Mm -hmm. Then video phones came and then you go on from there and you've got stuff like Windows, dial-up, broadband. So... Mm. It was like every year you can remember it. Like we're probably all about the same age where we can literally remember a world before all Mm. of that and Mm. sort of we watched it happen. Um, Like literally year year on year. I was a little bit younger. I think I went into secondary school when I got my first flip phone. Mm. Uh, And I remember my sister getting a Nokia when I was still in primary school and being really, really jealous because her and her friends were playing Snake and I wasn't allowed one. (laughs) It was it was a whole it was a whole saga. But yeah, like literally every single year after that, that when I was in year eight, someone brought in the first iPhone three and everyone was like cooing over that. By the next year, everyone had iPods, and the next year after that, like there was something else. And then that big thing, social media, happened. Yeah. <laughs> halfway through that. So to sort of answer your question in kind of a succinct way, it is, you know, what defines a millennial it is the people who have lived mm. through a vast speed of technological change. That has just come and rocketed. Exactly. Yeah. Unprecedented. And there's stats to, you know, there's stats to say and, and sort of opinions around that there's been more innovation in the last five years than there has in the last 30 years. Believe that to some extent, because if we take, you know, forget, last 10 Forget about pre 1990. If we take, you know, let's take 1995. Let's sort of say dial up as we remember it. The period between that and present day has seen unprecedented change Absolutely. in technology. I mean, the world is evolving faster than our minds can to cope with it. It's evolving faster than our um, social uh, causes, our understanding of how society works, uh, our laws. Mm. Like mm-hmm. to be whoever a lawmaker is, if that was 
I don't know how it works. I'm going to guess it'll be the sort of thing which is actually done through the government. But if you're a private firm that was able to write laws as new technologies come along, like you're probably one of the richest companies in the world. Like because yes. all you yes. had to do is go, oh my God, first we have to work out what's happening with this internet thing. Yeah. Oh shit, now they've got it in their pocket. Oh my God, now they're downloading music illegally. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's exactly. just this monster that's grown so many different mm. limbs. Um, so have you read The Coddling of the American Mind? No. no. So that book is about as seminal by Jonathan Haidt. It's about as seminal for what you're talking about now mm -hmm. as you can mm -hmm. get. And for anyone who is listening, go back and listen to Jonathan Haidt on Joe Rogan. Fantastic podcast. And he talks about uh, links between depression and anxiety and suicide in young girls and the advent of social media. Mm -hmm. There's this mm -hmm. line around about 2000 and eight and then another one around about 2012 where there's marked differences in behavior and stuff like that mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. one thing that you mentioned was to do with the um, awards for coming last this mm -hmm. participation mm -hmm. this kind of coddling right that's what jonathan refers to it as and personally for me as someone who was born in 88 i never saw any of that mm -hmm. i feel like i and i didn't hear about any of that until four or five years ago. So I think lumbering the millennials as they are, as they've been defined by the, the studies that you guys have looked at, into the snowflake generation, I think is erroneous. Like for me, yeah. there was there was none of that. So a perfect example of this is where you said people become hypersensitized, they take a lot of things mm. to heart. Mm. Um, if you have a look at purposefully exposing children who have a predisposition to allergies, to types of treats that have peanut dust coating, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you reduce the chance of them having anaphylaxis in later life by 25 to 50%. What that means is that if you purposefully expose young children to a small dose of something which potentially is uncomfortable for them, later in life they benefit. Mm, what mm. it means is that by uh, the, the same thing goes for there's higher rates of asthma in cleaner households if you disinfect the shit out of your house like vaccinations yeah. yes yeah um whereas you go to places like africa almost no asthma because the houses expose mm. children to low doses of what it is that is going to protect them yeah. later in life you're not meant to wash everything that you give to a newborn baby no, like every or pa new parents are always like, oh my god, make sure everything's really clean. Covered in alcohol. To, you meant yeah. to leave. You meant to leave some germs on. Well, that's so the that point. They build and, their immune uh, system. Socially, the same thing occurs, right? This is, but this is exactly it. At the root of this problem is this need to uh, put these conditions on what we call millennials. I mean, let, let you know, let's make no bones about it. It's very easy to use the term millennials and yeah. stuff like marketing. And, and you know, when a marketer says... Sounds trendy, doesn't it? Ex exactly. It's, it's also, you know, we can... And we, and we do define demographics, you know, in the same way that you've got Gen Xs, mm. you've got boomers. The problem seems to be with the focus on millennials under the spotlight and that is setting a precedent for we 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 were speaking about it in terms of that you know now now that we've done the whole millennial thing let's call it that and we sort of you know what do they want what are they like mm -hmm. what why do they feel like where this? do they shop exactly yes and all of mm -hmm. that and grouping sixteen year olds you know what it would have been back then grouping sixteen year olds with thirty four year olds mm -hmm. and saying they are exactly the Just same wildly, no, not. wildly they unhelpful <laughs> they're, they're, you know if you've got people at the start of their, you know, before they reach spending power and they're going to university, you've got people who are, you know, you're, you're, put, you're telling me you're putting them in the same boat as people who are mm. 34. Two kids, two dogs, mortgage. Well, exactly, do you know, yes. Do you know it's... what it is? When you said before about, so there's millennial stereotypes, which you say don't apply to you, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because you're on the older end of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And then there's the snowflake generation. Mm -hmm. But I think the problem is that the entire general public, and it may be like it's not so bad in the marketing industry because if if you know it then mm. like you know mm. we're putting it to good use we know what the actual boundaries mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. but all this media attention that millennials are getting and the reputation that they've got just refers to the, the snowflake generation which people assume is like teens and 20 somethings yeah when it's actually not mm. so yeah. when i think the majority of the time when people are saying oh millennial millennial they just mean young people yeah, yeah. and they don't actually and realize it stretches up to the age of 38 yeah especially seen as like me and Dom were discussing this earlier on. There is a an equivalent of a 
self-awareness menopause that you go through between the <laughs> age of around about 22 and sort of 30. Some people never go through it, but the majority of people do tend to go through it. Dom said um, when he was 23 and he was sober, going out, his friends would give him grief. When he's 26 and sober, his friends look at him with admiration mm. because mm. there is this flipping of consciousness mm. from the egocentric to the more mature. Mm. Mm. And the, there is a, a formative, the formative years as they're referred to, the end of that, like the final boss, is a reduction in ego for, yeah. mo for most people right. if you have, a, 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 I guess, a healthy uh, progression <laughs> through <laughs> you it. You can see that, yeah. Um, and what that means is that, I mean, and the other thing as well, millennial is such a, it's just such a buzzwordy term, oh, yeah. right? It's yes. the sort of thing that you can throw out. Yeah. Mm. And now it is Gen Z. Yeah. Mm. Like probably most people that read the news, that pick a typical person on the street in uh, Manchester, and most people are going to know what a millennial is. Yes. They'll go, I, yeah, like young, young people. Yeah. yeah. You're like, right, okay. But if you said Gen Z, they'd be like, What's is that a new computer game? Like, is that? <laughs> and this is it. And, yeah, and this, no this, this is one of the, this is another one of the interesting byproducts of the millennial generation is that because, you know, if I can sit from my point of view and, and I'd imagine many others, because there was so much emphasis on working out millennials, what makes them tick? That was, that was the headline you'd say. What, what makes them tick? Mm. What do they actually want? That we've used this as a precedent to question Gen Z, even to the point where we see reports questioning Gen A. Mm -hmm. Now, technically, yeah. Gen A's are about probably seven, five years old, and yeah. we're already making assumptions about what they are like, the kind of world they would grow up with. We've got the world of augmented reality, yeah. virtual reality, voice. It's because people are trying to like, we're trying to like get ahead of ourselves yeah, this time. Yeah. Like, well, we don't want the same mistakes to happen again that happened with the millennial generation where, you know, we spent so long trying to figure them out that mm. by the time mm. we've actually figured it out, we were already on they've the back already, burner. The spending power had gone, yeah, they are old. Like there's <laughs> another it. one already. But I think we're making a mistake there because like we were saying earlier about the speed of innovation that happened in the millennial timeline is not going to happen again it's already slowed if you look at before the millennial generation mm. innovation was more invention and it was quite slow you know mm. you had the computer mm. and then the first apple mac and then all of a sudden it was like boom 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 new products for consumers and now it's like okay now we're expecting voice to kick off we're expecting vr to do the same thing but it's not going that quickly it's it's taken a little bit of a dip yeah so i don't think yeah. it'll have the you know, the same the same effect as so the millennial generation did. You think it's been like a, a real state shift through the millennial generation mm. and now it's just different flavours of the same cake. Yeah, well, that, that's yeah. why they were so hard to figure out because nothing like that had ever happened before. All the new technology that came in, that's what shaped their mindset and opinions like slap bang in the middle. Mm. So why older millennials differ so much from younger millennials because if you grow up with the influence of a smartphone and social media, yep. you know, you can't underestimate mm. the effect mm. that that's going to have on you. Yeah. You you could you could put a, you know, you could get an empty room and put a bit of masking tape down uh, down the line of the room and say, right, everybody born in the 20th century stand on this side of the room. Everybody's mm. drawn on the 21st century stand on this side of the room. Um, or, or sorry, I should say anybody who sort of grew up formatively in the 21st century stand on this side of the room. And that is what we are, that is what we are looking at. And like, like we said, you know, we, we covered briefly on the innovations app and just to sort of reiterate that, I mean, okay, so we had smartphones. So, so sorry, let's start taking it from the beginning. We had uh, mobile phones, you know, that, that were bricks back then in the mid yeah, 90s. Car phones. Me, exactly. Yeah. They, they, you know, and they were still on wires and we still called them mobile phones. Yeah. And then you had mm. camera phones, and you had video phones, and you had MP3. Sony Ericsson, Bluetooth, who remembers that one? Sony Ericsson. Mini disc, don't forget mini disc. Mini disc. <laughs> yeah. so, while, yeah. so, while, so we've got this innovation that's happening rapidly in communication, which, you know, extends to broadband, uh, social media. Because let's not forget, you know, before Facebook and Instagram, it was Bebo and MySpace and, mm. and whatnot, yeah. and it was all of that. So while all this is going on, you've got changes in media. So DVD, VHS, which became Blu-ray, and then audio as well. So it's all, you know, this, this rapid period of change yeah. is what has shaped this generation. The problem when we talk about millennials is we always talk about a disconnect between millennials and brands or millennials and other generations. You know, we put the spotlight on them, we sort of push them into the, the sort of corner of the room and say, you are this, 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 because of this. Mm -hmm. And I think essentially, like like we've brought up, what we're saying is that it's not, you know, it's not about 
for the millennial generation had 9-11. We had atrocities like 9-11. Gen X had, uh, you know, the invasion of Afghanistan, the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, before that, we had world wars, the Vietnam War. Gen Z will have you know, Trump. Every every generation has their sort of societal kind of catastrophes, financial crashes, what whatever. It doesn't... I, 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 you know, I, I cease to believe that that plays such a part in the millennial construct as it does the Gen X construct as it does for any other generation. Mm. I agree. Okay. And how you are. Yeah. I, I do agree. I think um, when you're talking about millennials and you lump them in a corner, it, it does it does hark a little bit as like a derogatory term, mm. Mm. Which, mm. Is, yeah. which is which is probably not not very nice, like considering that that's where you come from and. That Simon Sinek thing, uh, it will be in the show notes below, the video that you're talking about, it just lambasts anyone who's mm. part of that group and says that you've got this incredibly kind of transactional value that everyone's very easy come, easy go, mm. like that they mm. treat careers like they treat Tinder um, and like swiping left and right. On, and there's something about, there's something that romanticizes um, the old ways that things are done, like having a job for life, yeah. staying yeah. with a partner yeah. for life. I did a podcast with Daniel Sloss, Netflix comedian. Um, we talked about he he talked about the fact that back in your parents' generation, you would have only known, you know, apart from the people at work, you'd maybe only known fifty people. Like you'd have had a connection with fifty people. Mm. So mm. really, like if you were having a bad time with your partner. Like, you got to stick it out and make it work. So you don't know where the fuck anyone else is. Mm. You're like, yeah. where, the fuck, where am I going to find an alternative? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, there's no one else at church. Yeah. Like, and that's it. And you're like, mm -hmm. well, if there's no one at church, I'm screwed. So the same thing occurs for that. But obviously, one of the, one of the key factors has been the, this serendipitous communication where you, you have a, a greater reach that's always on. Mm -hmm. um, and what that's enabled people to do is to be able to, they're emancipated and they're freed from the previous constraints geographically, um, uh, temporarily as well. Like you can speak to someone who's in America, who's in Australia, who's got instant communication, all these sort of things. Mm -hmm. And it's allowed people to be freed from the previous confines that they had. But also we don't, we don't know what that, we didn't know what that meant for people. We didn't know what it was going to enable people to be able to do. And there was no model that was pre-written. So you're right. Like it, it does feel a little bit like the old guard that are usually the people that push the millennials have a um, poor degree, a poor moral compass rhetoric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that old guard that are pushing it on us were the people that were supposed to guide us through it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, okay, was there a point at which social media came along where you came before Instagram and said you should maybe stick to trying to post virtuous and in, uh, things that represent your integrity as opposed to displaying mm. your life in a mm. way that yeah. is a, a, a highlight reel. Mm. No one ever said that to no. me. No. No. no one ever said you should, from the beginning that you have a smartphone, consider your time and your attention and look at the cognitive tricks that are being played on you. No one ever said that to me either. Mm -mm. Like, you know, it took ages for the internet to be around for people to even start to talk about like um, chat services like MSN for being like a, an area that ch children should be safe around. Yes, yes. Are you like, I, it, it does feel a little bit like the people that push the the narrative of millennials are, are this kind of the squalor sewage of, of um, low virtue narrative are, uh, they were the people that were supposed to guide they us. They were the ones who raised it. Yeah, absolutely. Like you, all that you're doing basically is Frankenstein's monster. Like mm. you were supposed to be the people that helped us through this. Um, and on top of that as well, like it sounds, it just smacks massively of bitterness. I think a it lot of the time. It's an interesting point. Yeah, I think that happens yeah. with every generation though. Yeah. Not saying, like, Jealous every, of the youth. Yeah. yeah. Every, every single generation will look at the generation below them and think, ugh. What are these ones doing now? Like yeah. your kids We've these started days. doing it. We've started doing yeah, it. With, exactly. you know, with, Everyone is say guilty Gen Z, of but it. Young, you know, the people who are younger than us. Everyone's guilty say, of yeah, it. The only, the only difference, I think, with um, Gen X's opinion of Gen Y, so Gen Y is millennials, Gen X's opinion of Gen Y has spread out to everyone. So now even millennials... Uh, like criticizing other millennials, mm, yeah. like their mm. peers. I have friends who 
they probably know that they are in the millennial generation, but they'll go, oh, I'm not millennial. I'm not like that. Yeah. I'm not a snowflake. I don't go out for brunch. Mm. That mm. that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, you're actually stereotyping yourself and actually you are a millennial. <laughs> and we're talking about this over brunch. But it's, it's become yeah, yeah. so... That, <laughs> exactly, yeah. I've, I've got, no, I've, where's the lie, though? That's I'd, so I'd, true. I'd take a hard line stance on this in a way because I feel, uh, you know, it's exciting. This, if, if we... I sort of want to use the word millennials sparingly, but young people at this time of technological change, this was an exciting time. And this was us finding it out for ourselves. It was like, you know, your parents' generation or their parents' generation discovering rock and roll. This was our rock and roll moment. Yeah. It was like, wow, I could be anybody I want to be mm-hmm. and post on my Facebook and post on my Beaver and do whatever. Now, the problem I see with from my own observations with the millennial generation is that Past generations have been able to define who they are themselves, in a sense. So uh, we think about Gen X. Gen X is Gen X is the you know they're the alternative generation. It was MTV and it was this and that. Now millennials, they've sort of had this label just put put on them, pushed on them, yeah. you know, unwillingly, um, and that's sort of stuck to the point that you know a, a millennial can. We, we, we can't shift this reputation that's been put on us. Mm-hmm. But you won't see that with boomers. You won't see that with Gen X. I doubt you'll see it with the generation that comes after Gen Z. Mm. Mm. That's so why so people th- get so disillusioned with it mm. as well. They mm. become like so separated from their own generation because they feel like these labels and these stereotypes have been put on them mm. against their will. Mm. Like no one wants to be categorized against their will. So and of course, again. like, yeah, like everyone, like we like belonging to groups, mm. don't we? We feel, mm. you know, affinities to certain like nationalities or a football team or mm. a hair color. <laughs> But all of a sudden, like, someone tells you, oh, you're a millennial, which means you're this, 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 and this. You go, well, wait a minute. Why are demographers and marketers deciding who I am? Um, So a lot of people have, yeah, gotten a bit fed up of that, haven't they? I think that's the irony of it in advertising is that the disconnect with this generation, in a sense, has come from the fact that it's not about, you know, let's find out who they are. It's about let's find out who they are among ourselves yeah, but it's and like, tell them who they are. Them. If imagine you know what like they, a boardroom. Let's dictate does. who they are. Yeah. Exactly. You imagine like exactly. a boardroom where everyone's talking about them and there's not a millennial in sight and they're all over there watching going, what are they, mm. are they talking yeah. about some guy, Some guy in a smoking jacket sat on a Chesterfield sofa somewhere. Yeah. Telling so that. Yeah, 100%. Like accusing people of not having any moral virtue and, and like yeah. being snowflake. Yeah, you, you are totally right. But the, the worst thing is they say that the best lies are the ones that have some truth in them. Mm. And mm. there is degrees of truth. Like we all know that friend mm. yes. who treats relationships and their career very transactionally, has junk values, mm-hmm. doesn't spend mm-hmm. enough time outside. Like the And it's the fact that there are elements of truth but by exaggerating it, by exaggerating this rhetoric, it means that everybody can cast it off and say, well, that's not me. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's yeah. so overblown that even the most cutting and accurate statement will still have a couple of bits that don't apply to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that doesn't help people to understand themselves. And it's why I think one of the reasons potentially why you're seeing this uh, resurgence now of introspective work mm. of the, the headspace meditation Sam Harris is waking up mm. app and mm. you know next door to the offices that we're in is the Manchester um, Buddhist Compassion Centre yes. where you can go and meditate it's like that's city centre Manchester right next to a trendy office and all this sort of stuff because I think that when people are being dictated poor values about themselves that they don't think that they align with it's very messy signals and what they're trying to do is work through, okay, well, maybe I am this. Oh, hang on. And then before you know it, you have to go away and find out yourself. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think what's really um, bad, like a bad side effect of that, especially for our industry, is what a lot of marketers and brands haven't realized is that all of that has bred like a subgroup of this generation of people who actively do the opposite of what their generation is stereotyped to do. So people who are of the millennial age but don't use social media, mm. the people who you know started buying vinyl records and they'll do things very sustainably and they'll act 
similarly to how their grandparents did because that's the new cool mm. and it's like mm. the people who are targeting yeah, like definitely. this age group are doing so by like the majority of the stereotypes and actually there's a really really large portion of the of them that are acting completely oppositely yeah because they don't want to be tarred with the same brush but there, but there is a, a caveat to all of this as well and that is uh that the whether we like it or not these stereotypes still work Yep. in advertising and I know this was something you touched on in a past episode uh, Chris I think with uh, Rory Sutherland and let's take one campaign for instance the a lot of people I'm sure would have seen it the British Army's campaign mm. that uh, you know snowflakes we want you mm. um, that went that went around um, play on the Lord Kitcher um, uh, status that he, that he did um, and it was that the uh, after they broadcast this advert that uh you know it was appealing to the gamer who stays up for 48 hours at a time mm -hmm. and these people you know your your agility your endurance the army actually found that their recruits doubled within a month basically that within really a month of releasing this campaign really? i absolutely yeah. hated the campaign so there was a massive backlash to this campaign snowflakes we want you to join the well, army you know come to the army we, we need millennials and it worked and yeah, well, I mean, that's just, theory. it's one of the circular mad things about advertising, right? Like that you can do something that's inflammatory. So I, I have no idea. I would love for, to see Gillette in whenever their next earnings goes Yeah. after mm. they, after they did the, um, the most recent advert. Um, and it is going down that risky route of kind of a, metacognizant look at what culture is mm. and the manipulation of culture by it, like uh, culture for culture's sake, almost mm. looking at it with a pure bird's eye view. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a high risk strategy. And like that's evidently worked, but then you think, okay, so it's doubled recruits, but what's it done for the British army's standing in society as a whole long term? Is mm. there potentially going to be some downstream effects of this that are a little bit more negative that mm. might not be so clever? Mm. And then the Gillette thing as well. I'm sure that sat around that boardroom table, someone said, and maybe half the room would have gone, yes, I love it. Men are going to really connect with this on a deeper level. And it could have gone well, but it got 10 to 1 ratio of dislikes to likes on yes. YouTube. So... Like, what does that say? I, I don't, again, I don't know what that's translated to in terms of sales. But yeah, the manipulation of the meta narrative about millennials is a dangerous game to play. Um, so what, what do you think is going to happen as we move forward then with Gen Z? Because that's, is that people after 96, 98? Gen Z, they say 96, 96. 97. Yeah, yeah, born after that. So I'll, I'll make the oldest Gen Z about coming up to Oldest 22 Gen Z is 22 or 23 depending on your definition because as mm. i said there's like a few different research um things you can but on that to. as well on just just to just to add on that the u.s i can't remember who the, an organization in the u.s uh only class only really recognized boomers as a official generation as an official demograph it's just what? boomers just the and the, well, the word boomers comes from that everybody was having kids after the, after the World War. Mm. So they said this was the population boom. These are the boomers. You've lumped so, like 50 years of people in together. Exactly. The difference, <laughs> so, yeah. difference between someone being born today and someone that's 50 years yeah. old. That's so, it, yeah. You, you can see the, the flaw in the system. Yeah. Like, to answer your question, for Generation Z, I don't know what's going to happen, but what we're trying to make happen and what we hope will happen is basically learning from the mistakes that were made with the millennial generation. We don't want to assume that just because, let's say, a group of people uh, spanning 15 to 18 years are exactly the same uh, just because of their age. So what marketers should be focusing on now is their mindset and their behavior. So if you look at things like Facebook Pixel's ability to track absolutely everything you do based on a click, based on a purchase, based on your cookies, they know everything, whether like it's your plans for the weekend or you know what play you wanna see next week, they know absolutely everything. And when there's that much detail out there that tells you, you know, who your customers are and what they're doing, why are we still paying attention to how old they are? Like that says anything about the way that they act and the way that they behave. Like we can still we can still use um, demographics loosely, but the point is it's not the most important thing that we should be focusing on. There's there's I, I, 
I yeah. There's I I agree in ways. There's still a place for age, definitely in in, in marketing, and there will be that. Uh, I think you know what we're talking about. And what it, is that focus on targeting more narrowly, aren't we? Yeah, definitely. With, just just more, just more, be age, like yeah. smarter with it. It's well, like don't just blanket target everyone. Don't pay attention to stereotypes mm. it, it's all about your unique audience and age will always play a part but it, i don't think it should be the most but important the, thing. but for me the, the wider the wider theme as well with gen z is i to answer the question as well i don't think there's going to be much change i think we're all you know as a society this goes outside of marketing and advertising i think we're waiting for gen z to be completely different and they're going to be this yeah. and they're going to be that and they're that, but you'll see a lot of the traits that, you know, are supposedly in Gen Z cross over to the millennial traits. Yeah. You know, Definitely. they are entrepreneurial. They are ambitious. So of course they are. It's because that you know, innovation has slowed. Like, so we were, we were saying yesterday, if you, you know how we were saying earlier about like every year for the millennials there's a different piece of technology. Mm-hmm. Now, every single iPhone regeneration or Samsung, depending on if you're Android or iPhone, every single regeneration is pretty much the same. Yeah. They just, you're charging a lot more for like not much innovation it's because even they have no room to grow the biggest software hardware companies are forced to just slow down the old models so that you buy the new ones because there just isn't Mm. that much Mm. like innovation is happening it's just not happening as quickly as it was before so when we expect generation z to be completely different to us Mm -hmm. we're assuming that something massive is going to happen like another another digital revolution and it's just not the case yeah no you are right that's a really really good point i think social media was a, <clears throat> I guess you could call it a, a technological revolution, but it was on existing hardware, right? Mm. Um, but certainly for me, one of the things that I am most concerned about, and uh, as a good um, avatar for someone who's regularly in contact with people that are 18 to 21, and some of them I'm heavily, heavily invested in, especially our managers that work for Voodoo Events, I want them to be the most efficient, the best that they can be, not only for the fact that it makes us more money, and but also just that I take personal pride in creating these monsters of their age who go out into the workforce and just walk all over everybody else because they've had this crash course in intensity on how to be efficient and how to behave and how to have discourse with professionals and customers and all this sort of stuff. Um, and what I see from a lot of them is that social media, forget the technology, the technology was simply the route. It was the delivery mechanism for the virus, but the virus itself was social media. And I know that that's an inflammatory term to use for it. There's a lot of good that comes from social media, but I think that for the vast majority of people, at least at the moment, I think it's netting a negative. I think that one of the um, podcasts I've done recently, someone uh, uh, analogized uh, Instagram as, uh, swimming through sewage looking for a diamond. <laughs> that you have this serendipitous connection with people and once every couple of months you might make a really, really good connection and you're like, that's exactly why I do it. But it's a gambler's fallacy. Mm. It's like how much cost have you sunk into this in order to turn this around? Mm. And you think, well, can I have my cake and eat it too? Can I have the serendipitous connection and have the um, things that I want, which is keeping up to date with my family and knowing the real stuff? whilst evading all of the sewage. And I think that that um, overall situation, that environment for people formative, people's formative years to be growing up in, I know certainly, and it may be different for yourselves, Theo, I know that you're a little bit uh, less on your phone as uh, than I am, but for me, certainly my capacity to be able to read and focus on a book, which is a little stimulus, has been versus 11 years old to now it is so much less yeah. like i have to I, work I with that. Yeah. so hard to sit there and not even just not fidget because my body is conditioned to a particular level of stimulus mm. that a piece of paper with non-moving words that are in black and white it can't match up with and it's been the last year has basically been spent on a morning retraining myself to be able to sit and look at something yeah. that's not triggering dopamine every couple of seconds. You know, so on our um, our most recent episode of Social Minds, we had a guest in from Iceland. She was a CBT therapist um, called Dr. Fiola Helga Dottir. And she was very, nice. very... Well done. Well it's done. good name, isn't it? It's a good name, yeah. <laughs> yeah. hard part over. Yeah. No, but she was telling us about some research that came out in January that actually says 
you know, we always say that social media is causing depression. It's earned that reputation mm. because there's been like an uplift in reports of people, more people being diagnosed. And half of that's because more people are aware that it's happening and they're more open about, uh, you know, reporting it or like going to the doctors. Um, and half of it probably is to do with social media. But she said that what they found is that people were more likely, especially young girls, were more likely to turn to social media when they were already diagnosed with depression. Mm. So it wasn't actually, there's a correlation there for sure, but social media wasn't actually the cause, it was the symptom. Yeah, um, Co coping mechanism. Almost. Yeah, definitely. But like you were saying about being able to, you know, stop and focus and read a book, like I've noticed that myself because you're so used to just being switched on all the time. And um, Dr. Fiola actually said that it's very important for our brains to have idle time. Um, like we need to be bored for the brain to develop properly, especially in young people. Like we just need time to do nothing. And it's something that no one gets these days because we just, I don't know about you, but I feel guilty when I'm doing nothing. I just sat there because you're expected to the, the, the always rhetoric, be switched on. The rhetoric that's been pushed, and I mentioned to, on the podcast I did with Dom, we mentioned Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, and Gary, if you're still listening, first off, I'm very surprised after what I said about you in the last episode. <laughs> but then on top of that as well, like the hustle and grind mentality um, mixed with always on communication is a dangerous combination. Like industriousness can be taken to an extreme. Now, um, Flow by Mihail Csikszentmihalyi, that's my difficult one to get out. Um, in the book Flow, what he talks about is the fact that human beings have the greatest sense of satisfaction when they are doing something which pushes them physically or mentally and is both challenging and worthwhile. So those are the things that you need to be able to do. You push yourself to the limits of your competence doing something challenging and worthwhile. Mm. And that's why he says that people who have a pr propensity towards being industrious find going away on holiday very difficult because at work you have – inherent challenge, you have a, a feedback mechanism that tells you how well you're doing and you have goals. Those are the three main things that you need. On holidays, just completely unstructured. Mm. Like you don't win an award for being the best sunbather or like, and I think, <laughs> I think that this is why a lot of people when they go away on holiday, especially young guys who feel like they have something to prove, will turn towards some form of game who can drink the most drinks tonight who can like kiss the most girls tonight or like uh, girls could do it in a slightly more different way where it's like who looks the best tonight who's got the the nicest dress who's got the best I'm like, how many landmarks can we mm. hit in one day yeah do you know what i mean <laughs> because you want to try and provide this sort of structure mm. but obviously what happens when you have what could be maneuvered towards a very virtuous goal, which is I'm going to constantly be looking at uh, assessing myself and finding out where I can improve and this, that, and the other. It's very easily twisted and bastardized into constant self-reflection with negative mind talk, um, uh, inability to switch off, and a desire to always have stimulus. Mm. Like if you go, I think the the... A study that I heard recently was that 75% of people take their phone to the toilet. And the only thing I could think was, I can't believe it's that low. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, like, yeah, but it, yeah. It's I, what you do when you're on the toilet. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, but it shouldn't be. And well, the time, the time on your own is, is, is super, super important. Deep Work by Cal Newport is the Bible on this. We'll be doing a book review on deep work and digital minimalism coming up soon. But if you want to check it out, the link will be to the Amazon shop um, in the show notes below. But Deep Work's just the Bible on this about the fact that it is psychologically, neurologically, and philosophically a good thing to do to focus on one task for a significant period of time. Yeah. And it's a skill that's increasingly being missed in the 21st you century. I think it's just like common sense. So that's why we're being ogled by older generations because they, they can see like the, what's gone wrong and they're, I, they're watching us. I, I agree with this to an extent, but I feel, and here's where I'll coin the generations again, I feel this bastardization of social media, well, well, relevant at times, I feel this is the same as sort of saying, you know, the, the, the counter argument so that will always be, well, you know, the people who are on their phones 24-7 are going to make them the best coders in 10 years' time yeah, when it matters yeah, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So um, while I agree with the fact that maybe there is less of a focus on books, I feel it's still, you know, the medium of getting information and getting knowledge has changed. And I think one of the things that we do are open eyes to with campaigns and, you know, in all sort of areas is that 
social media, you know, for all its wrongs has allowed us to act in a meaningful way. If you can take it at face value, there is the whole sort of narcissistic element to it. You know, you see influencer marketing and, and you sort of think, oh, you know, narcissism, narcissism, narcissism. But I'd have to question that without social media, would we be as in tune to the world? Would we care as much about the environment? Would we be, uh, would we get to this point now where we are so, uh, you know, that sense of connection with society, yeah. where we are so aware, so hyper aware of that there are many different walks of life, how other people yeah. feel. I think it's, I think it has, you know, while, while you could look at the person on the bus who's just looking in their phone, I think it has turned us into better communicators it's in how, a way and made us more open. It's how you use it as well. I think we are becoming more aware to the mistakes that we've maybe made. Like you said, like we were failed like by our, our parents or by the people who created this technology. No one educated us on safe use of it. And now we're sort of getting to grips with teaching ourselves. And I like to think of it like a car, like the first car, like how long was it before mm. they got seatbelts installed? Mm. And like you wouldn't, you wouldn't do You're that totally. now, would you? Mm. You need to learn how to drive the car. You need to, you know, put your safety measures in. Like I know, if I'm going to feel shit about myself, I'm not going to, I'm not going to follow people mm. who are posting things that are mm. going to make me feel shit. You just have to curate your feeds and know how to use it and turn to it for positive things. And like it can be so helpful I for like productivity and like you said, awareness about so many like causes. We just have to train ourselves to use it for good i think i think young people i think young people definitely do i think it, you know to answer the question in a way that 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 as well is i think a characteristic of gen z it, it, it's funny the irony of it has become a very millennial thing to say you kids you know you're, you're, you're addicted to social media all you do is watch you know youtubers and rapping toys and who wants to do that mm. you play with fidget spinners what are you doing mm. And that's that in itself has almost become a kind of millennial trait. So we are just, you know, going yeah, back. We're, we're already, already just as bad the, as Gen X. I get it. Well, I mean, to go on to what you said about the um, about the car analogy, it's perfectly correct. And what really this should be given for people who were the patient zero avatars mm. for the advent of all of these technologies, where the technology came before the best practices for healthy use did, and before the legislation did, mm -hmm. we should be given compassion. There should be a degree. And I, I feel that myself. Like I have, because for me, my mobile phone was a, a, a conduit for my business, which meant that I started to get into the rhythm of using it. And then the tactics which are used by particular social media apps to keep you on infinite scroll, auto playing videos, mm. red notifications, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I've now become a victim of those particular cognitive tricks. And I'm now having to undo the work that was done. But if you're someone who's coming through in Gen Z, screen time on an iPhone only came out six months ago, mm -hmm. where, you, where it um, allows you to track the time that you've spent on individual apps. If you haven't got it turned on, I, I urge you to do so just so that you can have a look, mm -hmm. go into your settings, have a look at screen time, and it'll be very revealing as to where yeah, you've spent your time. Revealing. Crazy mm -hmm. revealing, right? Mm -hmm. But then, so perfect example here, and this is within the same window, right? We're talking same device. Did you have an iPhone when you needed to download an app that allowed you to use a flashlight? So mm. you did, it wasn't always in the dock at the bottom. You needed to download yeah. an app yeah. or you had mm. to turn your video camera on with the flash activated. Yeah. yeah. And then it took them a while to realize, hang on, this is something which people need. This is a feature which we need to add. You think now like, why would you not swipe up from the bottom and turn your flashlight on? Whereas in the past, you had to scroll, find like flashlightapp.ios yeah. mm. and yeah. press that. And then it was like a little flashlight and you press that. So even within the window that we're talking about of technology, we have seen something come about which was needed and then be uh, internalized by the company that's creating the, the technology. And the same thing is occurring with social media that – it was this monster that's come about and before, uh, you know, Tristan Harris and the Humane Center, the Center yeah. for uh, Humane Technology and uh, all of this movement towards uh, understanding what the attention economy is and how it manipulates people. Mm. That's only just starting to catch up with what's actually been going on yeah. for a long yeah. time. Yeah. And people I think that, in the industry knew it's just starting to trickle down. For sure. It? It's to, the same issue with governments person. at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, like, you know, they, they've just got wind of it and they're like, hang too. on. 
Yeah, everyone's playing to catch up. And you're so right. It's because the innovation comes before the rules around it. Mm -hmm. Like, people are constantly playing catch up. It's like, mm -hmm. here's a new mm -hmm. thing. Okay, we've got to regulate that. And here's something else. And now we have to put rules on that. We're just constantly catching up with yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Although I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing sometimes. I think it's that experimentation phase yeah, is like, what uh, makes yeah. innovation so exciting. Like, that... I, I like to you compare it to literally anything that we've invented. Mm. It's always had flaws and it's always had dangers before people figure out, oh, actually, like, we need to amend that bit and we'll make changes here and mm -hmm. make it better. It's literally like anything else. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I don't think it's a bad thing. I, if, if rules had been put in place beforehand, if someone was able to predict, oh, this is going to be this big uh, thing that's going to come along and change everything and it's going to, like, make people sad and, like, steal all their attention and steal their data, they'll be like, okay, that's not allowed to happen. Yeah. And we wouldn't be where we are. We'd have lost yeah. out on so much. On, on, on the social point, I want to throw something at you, Chris. Um, how much of that manipulation, you know, of, of social media, how much of the development, innovation, whatever you want to call it, how much of that do you think is placed on it by the platforms and how much of it do you think is just us as a society sort of placing our own needs and wants and desires on this technology that's been able to... Like believing that the technology is an oracle or some panacea uh, exactly, fixed yeah, to all of our problems. Yeah. Um, I, Because of where my mindset is at the moment, I, I do have quite a negative view of um silicon valley and, mm. and and what they've done with regards to manipulating technologies mm. um anyone who has read much of tristan harris's work mm. will understand just how subversive and malicious some of the strategies are that people have that have been used the guy that created infinite scroll says it's the single greatest regret of his life yeah mm. Mm. because you think about just how many so a perfect example of this have you seen the film the big short no. Parts of it. Parts okay. Of it, so on the film, honest. on the film, The Big Short, um, it's about the 2008 financial crisis uh, crash. It is a, um, it's a fictional adaptation of what actually happened. And in it, this guy says that before he came to work on Wall Street, he uh, built bridges, and he said he worked out, um, he built this particular bridge which shortened a very highly congested route. And over the lifetime of this bridge, which was about 100 years, he'd saved billions of hours for people. That's how long he'd saved. And I often think about what converse has been done through social media. Mm. And you mm. think, right, okay, like if you were to look at how much time has been spent on that, and again, there are positives which come out of it. Mm. But mm. In, in my belief, we are netting a negative. And the problem is that in 10 years' time, I believe that there will be more control in place. That may either be in terms of best practices that are socially enforced, that may be in terms of legislation, that may be in terms of the way that the platforms actually self-manage and mm -hmm. self-regulate yeah. or whatever it might be. But the problem is that millennials and Gen Z, they've been the canary in the coal mine for this. So they've been the people mm -hmm. that have gone in first. They're the vanguard. They're, they're point. They're on mm -hmm. point in this particular invasion into a new realm of technology that no one's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that really calls for a lot more compassion for some of the problems that people are, are, are dealing with. Like mm -hmm. my mum and dad mm -hmm. don't have a problem with social media. Like my dad's got the largest font, sorry dad, my dad's got the largest <laughs> font available on his phone yeah. and he loves to, he'll send me photos of the dogs and stuff like that. But like, I have no concerns about whether or not my dad is up on Facebook until, or YouTube until two in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But my business partner's two-year-old son who has a Amazon Kindle to watch Despicable Me on, I get nervous when I see him around it mm. because I think I wonder downstream and I'm constantly like tapping on Darren and Colleen business partner and his wife about like, like make, make sure you're being careful like mm. the unbelievable parents mm. but I, it's a powerful technology that I think we need to yeah, be we definitely. need to be careful as we move forward with I think one positive thing that will come out of that like my my sister's recently had a baby and she's the same she's always asking me like oh like when when should we let this child have uh, you know an ipad because you see them don't they like playing with ipads and mm. it's like when do they get their first phone like should they be allowed social media yep. uh, when they're like pre-teenage and it's one of them like you're right like we went in first we're definitely <laughs> the guinea pigs um, patient zero exactly but hopefully we'll have something then to learn from and we'll just have to like anything else teach 
our kids how to use it, how to use it responsibly, mm -hmm. to use it in moderation, mm -hmm. and like how how to like reap its rewards without. Um, I don't you know, want to be a, I don't want to be a Luddite out. about this either. I don't want to be saying like there there are fantastic benefits, but it's at what cost, and can we mitigate the costs? And to look back, you know, we spoke about people that had gone to war. It wasn't that long ago that there was conscription into the army? Mm, mm. Like I'm complaining about the fact that this oracle of all knowledge in my pocket that's always on and allows me to connect with anyone at any time sometimes saps my attention. Like I'm aware that there is it relatively across all of time probably not that big of a problem. Yeah. Mm. But as we close towards what we want to be an ideal society, we need to narrow down the fidelity and the resolution at which we're looking at the problems. So saying, wow, it was, it, this is much better than it was 50 years ago yeah. isn't an argument. No. It's how much better could it be? Mm. Because if you're comparing stuff to how it was 50 years ago, you're doing what you, your um, census people did and you're just lumbering all of this, not only all of the people, but the entirety of the world. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Companies publish year-on-year -year profits. They don't publish like century-on-century -century profits because it, <laughs> it wouldn't be comparable. Yeah, sure, no, course, that's so yeah. right. I think it's it's interesting. I think we are, you know, and going back to that point about Gen Z, I think we're starting to see, I don't want to say pulling the reins on innovation a little bit, mm. but like we said, where there's been so much technological change. I mean, the innovations we talk about nowadays are very much to do with artificial intelligence and stuff like that, you know, which has been around for a lot longer than we think. And for me, a, a very big difference with that is they are not as consumer facing as social media once was mm. i suppose it's it's you know not, not everyone's not going around saying oh i'm just doing a new ai thing oh mm -hmm. man have you seen this this is ai yeah. you know it, it's 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 less and less so mm -hmm. uh like that yes it's being served to us in more sort of guerrilla ways you know chatbots mm. and stuff like that but um no i do i do agree with your point i've for me, I feel you know something else that would represent Gen Z and, and definitely Gen A is just like we became the sort of canary, you know, in the coal mine, you, as you can say. We we found a way to regulate this ourselves, I think, and I think that's that's not, that's not what we must not get away from too much. Is that mm -hmm. yes, there's going to be uh, casualties, there's going to be a lot of problems with this, mm -hmm. but I think Gen Z and Gen A's greatest benefit will be them finding their way into the world and regulating this technology how they want it to be. And I think you are seeing a shift where platforms and, you know, governments and whatever, may, you know, maybe they are not necessarily right about everything. And I think consumers are starting to see that. And, you know, that's, that's displaying itself in many ways. I think consumers are taking back a degree yeah, of control. Definitely. It's like, I think it's a bit of a um, a multitude of factors. Like the platforms are having, they're being forced to make new features like screen time. Mm. Um, and, you know, all the, mm. the new guidelines around you know, safe use and usage policy and stuff like that, they're being forced to put those changes in place. So while that's going on, consumers, as you write, they're also getting a little bit savvier because mm. they've watched, they're going to watch uh, all the consequences yeah, happen. Yeah. They're going to watch it happen to us. And a funny, and, and another funny thing improve. is as well is that you're seeing features that have come out, you know, that somebody, you know, a, a group of sort of directors or whoever who work at, you know, Facebook have sort of dreamed up and said, oh yeah, the world needs this. Yep. And you're seeing a lot of consumers saying, oh, actually, Not fuck bothered. off. Do you remember when Instagram? <laughs> do you remember when Instagram? <laughs> no, we don't. We don't yeah. need that. I'll don't take that feature and I'll hack it to do that. that. Yeah. Do you remember when Instagram updated a bunch of people's apps? Did you see this? It must have happened yes. in here. And yes. it, it, did you see this thing? I know what you're going to say. So Instagram so... Instagram sent out an update. I think it was to around about 10% to 20% of users. And it complete, imagine the app's completely gone. And imagine st a stories feed that you have to move through individually, mm -hmm. one by one, and you can't navigate. Yeah. Mm. And they released this update to like 10 or 20% of users and just all hell broke loose. It was meant to be a very, very, very small test to like less than 1% of users. It came out over the Christmas break and I was on our Twitter and I had to report on it. And about an hour later, I had to c amend the report because I said, oh my God, Instagram, massive update. It's changed its oh, entire interface. Yeah, it's yeah, gone it's from a scrolling that, yeah. feed. <laughs> 
<laughs> Same Mark Zuckerberg on the phone. Yeah, yeah. Stop talking about uh, the other. Excuse yeah. me, Mark. <laughs> Adam, sorry. Listen, Mark, mate. We don't care. We <laughs> talk about this update. Yeah, it it went from a, a scrolling feed to scrolling that way, and all that speculation that we've been doing about you know will stories overtake mm. the news feed. It felt like it was happening. Literally within the hour, it had been taken down. Pulled and they'd and gone, then you oh again. my god, I'm really sorry. That test was not meant to go out to mm. as many people as mm. it did. And There's then we were all guy. left going, is that is that what they're going to change? Is it <laughs> is it happening? It was like film doesn't go that way. Yeah. What what are you doing? Snapchat redesign. It's like yeah. Twitter have brought out this new public beta testing thing where they've actually invited everyday people, you know, not just tech insiders who are connected to every single Yeah, I think to Twitter's say, actually being really positive. Features. If you want to look at a platform that's making changes for good, take a look at what Twitter's doing because they're being so inclusive of their updates mm. Uh, mm. and they're not just Pushing blasting them. people see, with um, horrible spam stuff. Did you listen to Jack Dorsey on Joe Rogan? I didn't. No, I will. I Still will. It's, it's it, definitely yeah. on so the to watch list. He's done his yeah. second one. He came back on a second time. Oh, did he? So he did a first one and Rogan doesn't usually... What I particularly like about Joe Rogan, the reason that I think he's a good podcaster is he just puts his stuff out. Like he's effective at what he does. The reason that he's the best podcaster in the world is because he asks the question that you would have asked if you'd had half an hour to prep for that one section. Mm. <laughs> and then he asks it straight away by riding the crest of now at all times and constantly asks the best questions. But one of the other reasons that I think he's so good is the fact that he just doesn't care what people think it doesn't check the comments on youtube it doesn't really respond to stuff like that but f one of the few times alex jones was one of them and jack dorsey was another one he got so much backlash because people wanted him to go after jack dorsey about why are people getting banned why is milo the unopolis but mm. banned why is sargon of a cad banned mm. why are you deplatforming these people there appears to be a left-leaning bias and all this sort of stuff so he's like, right, fuck it. Like, we're going to have Jack back on again. Then Jack brought his uh, head of the safety team, which yes. is basically the woman that presses the ban button. Saw this. Um, and he brought in uh, Tim Poole, who is like the the Ben Shapiro or he's like the Hoist Gracie of cutting people down in fast debates, like a, like a scalpel precision. Uh, how he's able to deploy this stuff and he came fully armed like study after study after example after example after example and during the conversation sometimes with this especially when you see silicon valley in there you want to like yeah stick it to the man like fuck the machine yeah and part of me wanted that that kind of cathartic pleasure that you get from seeing someone who's successful just get smashed all over by someone who's witty mm. like there's mm. something that i enjoy about that um <laughs> weird but <laughs> but what ended up happening was a very um, – Tim continued to be militant throughout. Like his parting words were, I still don't like you guys. I still don't believe that what you're doing is for the greater good, and I still hope that Twitter goes down, but thank you for your time and coming on. That was essentially what he said. But throughout the whole conversation, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, and uh, the woman whose name I can't pronounce, so I'm not going to try, who was his head of the safety team, they basically said, we don't understand – what this technology really needs. And we are learning as we go the same mm. way that you guys are. Mm. Can we have a little bit of compassion back? Mm. Um, and there's some things that seem like there's maybe some double standards that are maybe a little bit more critical. But this degree of compassion overall, I think for people that have had to deal with high degree of technological change, a lot of financial ups and downs, um, and uh, the advent of social media, you also, I can't say that I want that for us whilst not also allowing the executives and the people who are in the marketing departments to also be given the same yeah. amount of freedom. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I think like, it's, it's harder to um, forgive some more than others. But I, yeah, like I said, I'm a really big fan of what Twitter's doing because they'll admit that they're not perfect. And the whole time they're just being transparent. Mm. They're just, they are really mm. trying to be like, open and honest and inclusive with their users. And yeah, they'll, they'll get things wrong, but they I, I believe have better intentions than who goes, some others <laughs> who goes on joe rogan to speaking to millions of people as the ceo of a company twice and then the second time knowing that joe's basically bringing in your arch your, your kryptonite mm. yeah um with another person who's the person that is like public enemy number one essentially to just have discourse mm. and to try and be as open as possible i mean that that for twitter will have done more than any advertising campaign can have done and obviously what did we say before high risk strategy yeah like you could have gone on and just fluffed it because especially at the beginning 
the being very very militant it's it's quite sort of frictiony and they're just constantly having to swallow this stuff from Tim as he's just unloading stat after stat after stat and you think after a while you begin to see that they they're just human beings again the same mm. do you know what i mean like the Jack Dorsey didn't know what Twitter was going to become. And I, to a degree, I don't believe that Mark Zuckerberg did. Like, you look at him in the, uh, the, those Senate hearings, and he's just a guy that made a website and is now like, oh, my God. Like, just yeah. looking up at the sky. I made this joke earlier on. He looked where, like a lizard, not uh, a man. He turned from He did man look a little lizard. bit. Well, I mean, maybe that's what that just degree terrified. of fear does. Yeah, yeah just exactly. like clammy and so pale and scared. But very I, but very I, damp. Yeah. But with this as well, I, I, I go back to my point because you, you're completely right. And my, my stance on this will still be, okay, like you said, you know, that this is the medium of delivery. This is the media. This is the technology. This is whatever. Society... You know, for for the large part, we have sort of put you know what we want to see onto this. Mm-hmm. You know, we the the endless news feed, for instance. You know, and, and the scrolling, for instance, probably started off as a good idea. Well, the th- we the thought th- right, we'd make a bit of money on it, but the, the problem is like, it, the features wouldn't have stayed if they weren't effective. Exactly, it's natural exactly. evolution for the features that exist on the technology. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The same thing for the reason that the next episode countdown happens on Netflix is that it improves retention. So more people watch the rest of the series if the countdown occurs than if it doesn't. If it was the other way around, if it was the other way around, they wouldn't put it on. Mm. So Mm. your own choices determine the root of the technology. I think the criticism is we didn't choose our own cognitive biases and you are triggering something that's there in the back of the brain when I want to be able to be thinking about it Mm. with this bit. And you're like... Okay, so, but guys, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much yeah, for coming yeah, on. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah. us. It's, so next time I will be on that couch. Yeah, and we'll do you swap. both yes. sit here? <laughs> Is that the way it works? <laughs> yeah, sits, he sits uh, on I'm my lap. Between, yeah. you know, okay, yeah. the, yeah. Uh, Roman Mike. Yeah, exactly. we're like yeah. tiered <laughs> that way. I love it. Uh, guys, link to Social Minds Podcast will be in the show notes below. Link to all of the stuff for Social Chain will be there as well. Don't forget to press share if you enjoyed this. And if you've got any comments about what we've brought up today, fire them in the comments on YouTube. Really appreciate it. Guys, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Oh,